Exactly. All right. Well, we're going to get started here because we're already at 150 people and I think we're expecting more. But um, the whole reason we're doing this event is because people want to hear more from you. So I want to maximize our hour together. Um, to those of you from the Boardless community who joined round one, we're excited to have Dambisa back. And I know for many of you, uh, because we've got even uh, more new additions on this call, you didn't get a chance to hear Dambisa the first time, but we're all pretty excited uh, to hear her wisdom. Um, particularly on boards, but we'll take other, we'll take other. <laughs> as well. um, Dambisa, welcome back. Thank you. It's, uh, Thank you. Wonderful to have you. This time we've got some more questions for you, but we also had the audience give us questions ahead of time. And for everybody who's on the phone, we're still going to take live questions. So thanks to those who submitted already, but we will take live questions. You can put them either in the chat or in Q&A. Those are the two things that I'm monitoring and we'll try and get to all of them. Um, so Dimby, so this time we're going to go right to the heart of where a lot of the questions were from session one, which isn't necessarily about how boards work, but how the people on this phone call can make boards work for them. So I like the se second round of questions we've gotten seem to be far more, I would say, intimate and people are looking for your guidance on, you know, for themselves, um, how really to make that make that move and, and some of the more personal stories you have in the boardroom. So I'm going to actually start us off with a more difficult one, uh, just to warm us up here. Um, one of the first questions was, have you ever experienced tokenism in the boardroom? And has that ever been something you experienced both as a candidate interviewing or even when you were on the board? Um, and if you've ever felt it, how did you navigate it? So it's an interesting thing because I feel like, uh, and I, I, I'm assuming that tokenism doesn't mean racism. Um, you know, I feel like racism is quite explicit. You can always say, hey, I remember somebody called me this or I was treated in a particular way. I think tokenism in a strange way is a bit more nefarious. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what my, what my colleagues think of me, especially on my first day in a boardroom. I don't know whether they think, oh, this person's here because she's a black woman, I roll. Um, especially as we spoke last time, because my background is quite unconventional. Um, when I joined my first board, I was 39 years old. I'm a black woman. I'm from Africa. I did not come from the C-suite. So there's a lot of reasons that people might form opinions about how it is and why it is I'm actually in the boardroom. Um, but, you know, the, tr the truth is, you know, I, I rightly or wrongly, they tend not to be bothered by that kind of thing. I think that the way that you assuage any guilt, and yes, do I have insecurities about being like, oh gosh, I'm going to be exposed? Of course, we all do. But I think that that has led me to be much more um, numeric driven, numbers driven in terms of my thinking, really um, thinking about pros and cons of issues, trying to be less ideological. I think very often people fall into traps when they rush into a board meeting or a call and they are uh, um, sort of strategic, sort of very dogged about a particular view. Very often, if you think about it, it's really driven by emotions or an individual uh, experience that's not scalable, um, you know, in, in its entirety. So I think those are some of the things I would focus on to avoid this concern about being a token. I think people will respect you, even if they don't agree with your um, leaning on one side or another, they'll fundamentally respect you if you're clear in your thought, if you use numbers and sort of supporting evidence. Um, and, the, and the more that you are, um, I would say, less individual, I know somebody that had this one experience, it's very hard from a government perspective or from a, a, a senior leadership perspective to design policy um, around, I had an experience and I feel really bad about, uh, uh, you know, about that particular experience, if, if you see what I mean. So I think I try very hard to think about less about the downside of, of tokenism, I think it's hard, um, but I do think we're in a world where, you know, your race, your gender is going to get you likely to or increase the odds of you getting a, an interview, but competence is still the thing that's going to get you the job. So you might get the interview. If you don't show yourself to be competent, you're just not going to get the job. So it's really important to, to, to display that, that ability in your conversations. Got it. Well, I think you actually touched on two things there. And sorry, everyone, we dived right in. I thought about an easy question, but I was like, damn visa, let's just get going with a harder one. Um, the one thing I would note is I'm sure you felt it, whether I was there because I was a woman or a person of color or because in fact, I'm a CEO. Um, I will say I have certainly been in many rooms as I'm sure you are where you are the only, right? So it's hard to sometimes hear tokenism from being the only. And I think the caution you're giving us is when you come to that room and then show up only as sort of like 
this is my experience versus trying to bring data to the collective experience. Maybe that kind of. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the other, you know, related to that is that, you know, I really urge people not to go into these rooms thinking your colleagues are standing behind a dark curtain and they already hate you. Mm-hmm. You know, I um, I, I, I feel a little bit guilty uh, outing him in this way. But when I first joined one of my boards, the man sitting next to me is what, let's call him 65 to 70 years old, was raised in the South. Mm-hmm. Um, and I subsequently, someone wrote a book as a very, very racist um, South. And he grew up in that period. Um, and just as much as it's been a big journey for me, to end up in the boardroom. It's been a huge journey for him. He grew up, you know, almost all his life thinking that women and minorities are second class citizens. And so now all of a sudden, like it or not, you know, much much the way that I've been shoved into an environment that can be quite isolating. He's been shoved into an environment where, uh, you know, he's sitting next to somebody he has been told time and time again was beneath them. And so you won't believe it, but he and I become basically, he's my, he's my best friend. Um, on this board. I love seeing him. We have so many similar interests. We would never have guessed because our backgrounds are so far. So I would just urge you to try and find commonality because a lot of the problems that need to be addressed in the boardroom um, are, uh, you know, are complex. They, they don't have an answer. They need judgment and goodwill. And uh, I think that having the, the sort of perspective to be open-minded as opposed to assuming everybody's against you, which by the way, we all fall into that trap, especially, I mean, I, I'm a, my first few boards, I was the only woman um, for for many years, um, and it, it's a, it's a lonely place and and lonely visible only visible minority. It's a, it's a lonely place for sure, but um, you know I also say very cheekily that it, it just means that people will always remember you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know yeah. they like, more and more use it to your advantage. I wear it as a badge of honor because. You know, when I was working at Goldman Sachs, I'd go to meetings, there'd be 10 white guys and me. I know that they may not remember my name, but they'll definitely remember, oh, yeah, there was that woman. Um, and so you should totally like ham it up and use it to your advantage. They'll always remember the, the person who um, was sort of different. Mm hmm. Yeah, those are those that that is completely, uh, completely true. So we're going to go to another topic that there were there was a lot of heat around in the last uh, session. And there isn't in this one, which is if you were to think about the decision making matrix for hiring a board member, and then for you as a prospective board member in deciding, you know, which board you might want to join, what would be the top three things? I mean, this is a two part question on your decision making matrix when you are interviewing candidates, what are the three things that are at the top of your matrix for how you would decide who to choose? And then we'll come to the other side, which is if you're on the candidate side, what should be on your decision making matrix, you know, again, in choosing a board. So you're interviewing board members, what are what are you looking for? You know, it's interesting because I think it would have, it might have changed slightly. Um, so for me, by the time I'm interviewing somebody, I know that they have the sort of uh, motherhood and apple pie aspects down pat. They're sitting in front of me being interviewed for a board seat. They know that they know how to look at a balance sheet and financials. They'll know about sort of operations. They'll know about um, how a company's what the company's business model is, for example. Um, so what am I looking for? I'm looking for somebody who's hungry to keep on learning. Um, these issues are constantly moving. I, I, you know, I was just saying six months ago, I never in my wildest dream thought we'd be talking about voter rights in the boarding boardroom. Now we are. You know, mm-hmm. is this person uh, really like a continuous learner, willing to look about, look and think about how the world is constantly moving and changing? Um, related to that, I like people who have got opinions but are not ideological um, to the mm-hmm. point that it's going to be it's going to be unconstructive. They won't be able to work for it with a team because people have different views. Mm-hmm. Um, they won't be able to understand that sometimes you have to sort of reduce your speed. It's kind of like marathon running, which I've done badly uh, many times. Um, sometimes you need to reduce your speed to finish the race and. They, you know, they might just think we should constantly hard charge on some of the big issues that are in the newspaper. And I think that that makes it very hard to steer a massive ship. Um, I think also the other thing that, that we have tended not to focus on that I would definitely focus on now is ethics. Like what is a person's ethical compass? I think this is probably a little bit less so in terms of interviewing candidates because there's a lot of vetting uh, at the board level, but for CEOs, oh yes, they're the standard bearer of, uh, of, uh, of the ethics of a company, the corporate culture of a company. And as you know, in just 18 months, we had 400 people, uh, CEOs and senior business leaders fall afoul for me too. So those, I'm really interested in 
really good judgment, a team player. Um, and maybe I'll just add one more for bonus, which is that I used to, because I'd grown up as a, my PhD is in economics, I've tended to grow up in talking to people in economic policy. Um, we tend to think about the, has, the glass, glass being half empty. We're always worried, oh my God, digitization is going to put people out of work. Oh my God, economic growth is going to be low. That, that doesn't help companies grow and progress. So mm -hmm. yes, I, I would say problem identification is critical, but don't be a naysayer. Somebody told me that and it was like the penny drop. They're like, listen, we want to hear about those risk mitigation uh, you know, things that we need to focus on, critically important. But try and think about like, okay, this is the problem. What might some of the solutions be? Even if you don't get the solutions right, people will feel more energized that you are looking for solutions and trying to keep the world uh, moving forward. So don't be deconstructive. I and mean, I think that's one of the things that I find quite disappointing and stressful about in the world environment we're in right now. People want to tear down this, they want to you know, cancel that. But there's, we need, we, that's not going to progress society. What we need is to come together and say, hey, this is a really bad situation. We've got COVID, we've got financial crisis, we've got all these things, but here are three things you might do. What do we think about the, the way forward? So I would add that as well. Uh, well, you know, you always give that, you've given that tip before and I love it, this idea of being the being an optimist. Uh, it's so funny. We don't talk, we don't, we talk about all the skills and competencies people should have. We often don't talk in leadership and board journeys about the importance of being an optimist and a realist or a possibility seeker is what I would call absolutely. it. Because I think, that, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, almost all of these environments that we're in as leaders are environments where you have to progress and the rate of change is fast. So being the person who points up um, there's a critic, uh, like a very observant critic of what doesn't work has so much value, but there's far, you know, and that it's important, but you know, but yeah. it's also about being able to lay out kind of a vision for things that you should try, right. And be willing to, yeah, uh, absolutely. Be to absolutely. Because ultimately the management team can't go back and tell the workforce, oh my God, I just had this meeting. The world's like, is going to hell in a handbasket. They need to be able to say, guys, we've got some real risks, but Here's a way forward. Here are you know. five solutions. Yeah, I think exactly. the orientation is uh, is probably uh, I would posit something that a lot of people don't talk about because I think many times when people enter leadership situations, any leadership situation, and let's say you have imposter syndrome, one of your natural reactions is I want to look smart, right? And I will say it's a lot easier to look smart when you are critiquing, you know, using critical analysis on something that's gone on. And actually, and that shows that you're really smart and you can be an analytical person. It doesn't necessarily, I think it takes far more courage to say, hey, I hear you, here's some ideas, here are three other things we might try. Knowing that none of them may work, but that doesn't make you any less smart in the boardroom. Perhaps exactly. is that your point, the person who opens up possibility. And I think opening up possibility, the reason I'm dwelling on this is I think it is more needed than ever in boards that are seeking change. And so I don't think it's enough to look smart. I think you do need to look you do need to look forward and be a board member who's looking forward. So I Absolutely. really appreciate it. And can I just add very, very quickly, that, you know, just always remember that for many boardrooms, in particular, I would say in the United States, the CEO is coming to the board for a, as a safe haven. Um, mm -hmm. They are constantly being asked um, for help and guidance and um, suggestions, and they need a place that they can go you know, they're obviously going to be checked and challenged. Our job is not to be friends with the CEO. Um, but at the same time, they need a place where they can say, gosh, you know, I'm really struggling with a pension, you know, deficit that's increasing because yields are negative, or, you know, I'm really worried about digitization. They need a, a safe place to have that debate. And so they can't just think, oh, gosh, if I go to the board, all I'm going to get is a you know, a, a sort of double clicking, as my nephew calls it, of, uh, of the, the issues and no, not enough conversation of what potential solutions might be. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, by the way, I don't think boards are perfect at this either. I know we need to move on from this topic, but I've been in many boardrooms where people are content to talk about all the problems and very little time is saved for solutioning. Does that make sense? Meaning like everyone sort of dissecting and analyzing and piling on, but you often yeah. you leave those conversations without a constructive path forward. So I think this is an yeah. interesting point. So Land, let's spin the, I'm gonna to go to the comments already because you have a ton, but let's oh. spin that question around and just say, hey, in return, if you're evaluating a board to join, what are the top three things that um, you should be thinking about as a candidate in your decision matrix? So first of all, um, assume that you're gonna be there for a while. 
um, you know, obviously things happen. Companies get acquired, you know, you term out on your, you know, your uh, tenure, et cetera. And these things have happened to me. Um, but I think you should assume that you're going to be on a board for 10 years, which basically means you better well like what they produce. Um, and so I think it's really important that people say, hey, I want to be on the board of, you know, take your pick, Chanel. I better love what they produce. I want to be on the hard. board of, of Facebook. Well, I better know, I better love what it is that they produce because there's nothing worse, I think, than being on the board of something where you really find the widget that they're producing incredibly boring. You're never going to be able to add value. I think it sounds attractive in the short term. It's always a problem that in the longer term. Um, I think uh, also, um, you know, assume that there's going to be problems. Companies have problems. Um, that's the nature of business. And I think in that respect, look very carefully at the people who are on the board. You want to make sure that there are people who are not going to jump off when the, the sort of proverbial uh, kitchen gets hot. Uh, you know, oh, gosh, I got to run away my you know, protect my reputation. I, I think I've said this to you before. I take a very dim view. Um, to candidates who have seen to roll off and on, on the boards because things get a little bit tricky or oh, better protect my reputation. I can assure you bad stuff is going to happen. In my tenure, I've had a, a chairman die in office. I've had a company go from, you know, nearly $60 a share down to $7. I've had activists in, this, in the share price. I've had a company acquired after we thought it would never be acquired for $100 billion. I mean, the list is long. And you know, that is the one thing I can guarantee you. So just prepare yourself um, for, for bad stuff to happen and therefore make sure that you're going to be huddled uh, in a tunnel. Uh, if you're going to, if you end up being huddled in a, in a sort of a tun tunnel cave uh, with the, the other board members, you that you like them. Uh, and so it's hard, it's, I, and relate to that just as a specific piece of what to do with that. Go and meet these people before you join the board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's quite an intimate thing. It's only 12 people narrowly, and you're going to end up in one of the committees, which means you're going to get to know two or three people extremely well. Um, spend time with these people. Don't, if you don't like the sort of culture of the company or the ethos of the, the board team, don't join them. No matter how much pressure you're on, it's just going to come to bite you and to be so obvious and you're going to get bad reviews um, when you decide you're going to leave. So I would just add that as, you know, make sure you like the people, maybe make sure you like the products uh, and make sure you like the, you respect the corporate culture because these things matter. Got it. All right. So uh, I'm related to that question. I'm going to the chat. As I said, we have lots of questions coming in. Um, somebody, somebody's making the point, I think it's Robin, that beyond um, trying to be solutions oriented, you know, as opposed to just critiquing and looking smart that way, what other insights do you have to share in helping executives in specific shift their mindset you know, from this kind of doer to oversight? Because to your point, like if I come in and I say, hey, these are my five solutions, but I'm getting to some specificity that I'm telling you how, <laughs> you know, you end up in that doer mode. So what, for a first time board member, making that active shift from doer to oversight, any other tips? That's actually a really good question because I've seen it happen time and time again, how no matter how many times people tell you, listen, we are here in an oversight fiduciary mm -hmm. custodial role, we should not be providing anything more than that. People fall afoul. It's the worst thing. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit flippant here, but your colleagues find will find you irritating. Um, the management team will find you irritating. So what, what do I think is a good idea? Number one, just do not show up at the company or the organization more than a handful of times a year. I think, you know, very surreptitiously, people end up finding themselves going to the company multiple times a week. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that already, um, without those, those guardrails and just saying, I'm not going to go there often, um, leads to bad outcomes. You start spending too much time there. They give you an office before you long, even just the optics of you being there tend up to lead to a lot of bad blood. I think the other thing, which I think is underplayed, um, is make contact with the exact person who's your mirror um, image. If you're coming from a finance function at company X, you're joining the board of company Y, bond with the CFO. Um, if you're in marketing in company A and you're joining the board of company B, go find the CMO and bond with them because that's that they will help guide the relationship. They'll know that you're keen and eager and happy to help. Very often they'll reach out and call you and say, hey, listen, I'm having a bit of an issue with this, but it will be, there's a, a formed relationship there that takes the air out of this sort of, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm going to tell you how uh, things are done in my company or why, we're, you know, this is what you should be doing instead. 
um, and moves you into that, that oversight role. Um, you know, it's it's worth just saying also that, you know, the, the very reason that people are put on these boards is for that T, or what I call a T board member. We talked about this last time. You know, you have deep expertise in a particular area, but we still want you to be able to contribute in many other areas that the board has to deal with, risk, compensation, audits, nominations, governance. I mean, there's a long list of things. Um, and so, you know, there is an expectation that you'll lean in more into your area, but I would just be extremely careful about um, cutty, uh, cookie cutter types of responses or also not fully understanding the business model of the board that you're on and thinking you can just translate it. That's just always unhelpful. But I, I, honestly, Sukender, I think a lot of the answers around managing this relationship um, really are, are more about tactics and making sure you're not there all the time, making sure you only you know really bond with the people who can, can get value add from you because they will often reach out to you and say, hey, Sukinder, we're having an investment conference. I know you're really great in investments. Do you think you can come and speak to the team? That's the best outcome. And I think a lot of that comes from them knowing, hey, I'm here, but I'm not going to be around harassing you. And when I do add comments and value in the boardroom, um, I'm, I'm going to make sure I know that the, the business model of this board uh, company, as opposed to bringing my, my perspective from another company yeah. where the business model is different. I think very, 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 very helpful. So I'm going to I'm going to skip through a different bunch of questions here. I'm going to knock one out myself, um, if you're okay. So somebody, somebody is asking on the thread, Regina, what is Dambisa mentioned terming out? What's a typical term limit for board members of small businesses? If you're cool, I'll take this one. Small businesses, it's not ten years. Often it's five. If yeah. you're in an early stage startup or mid stage stage private company, in fact, I would say it's even more often three. I mean. Because when you have companies that are going through rapid growth and you know scaling to be public, once you're public, it's a very long commitment. On the way to being public, you know, I've seen board members at Series A and B companies that you know join and move off in three. So I think term limits are much shorter for small businesses because you don't know what the business is going to need in two years, right? Like I mean, particularly when they're right. rapidly evolving. So I think you should be steering yourself more to sort of two to three years, three to five years. Dan Beza's point when you're public, five to 10 years easily um, are the ways to think about it. Um, there's this other neat uh, topic that's on the thread, not necessarily, again, these are sort of disjointed a little bit because I'm seeing some pretty interesting ones. Um, uh, great point about board director chemistry. You've made it a few times. Do you think boards are more generally consensus driven or do you think they're actually accepting of robust debate? What is your... Um, and, and how do you be mindful of this and manage, you know, if you're in a consensus driven board to get them to debate, if you're in a debate driven board to get them to be efficient? What's your belief about inherently are boards good at this? So um, two things pop into my mind. Um, one is the best type of chairman or independent director that I've seen manage whichever scenario you just uh, point out is, is someone who, especially for what I call corner solution problems, things like we're about to do an M&A transaction, we're mm -hmm. about to hire a new CEO, these very big material issues that are going to really set the company in one course or another, they literally force everybody to speak um, and give people the opportunity to speak. Why does that matter? Because I think as you know, for day-to-day -day mechanics of how boards interact, but also for these types of uh, end uh, um, decisions, some people just are less inclined to pound their, put their fist on the table and say, this is how I, I think, uh, I think uh, we should think about these issues. So I would say that it's, I'm answering the question by saying, what do I think works to av avoid either of these uh, corner no, right. solutions that you just yes. uh, mentioned? I think those, that's what I would say is the best, uh, best practice. Um, you know, the other thing that strikes me is that it also has a lot to do with where you land on this has a lot to do with jurisdictions. In mm -hmm. the UK, the um, it's very much driven by a check and challenge culture. Uh, in fact, um, one of my board, uh, the CEO of a board I was on um, said, oh, you know, I don't need an activist in the stock. My activists are my board members because we're always at them. What about your assumptions? What about this? What about that? And that's just the culture and the nature there. And so there's, there tends to be, I would say, much more consensus among board members in that type of a situation. And they tend to go after the CEO and the management. Not in a, I don't want to use the word adversarial, but certainly there's more tension in the relationship. I would say the relationship in a U.S. board typically is it does have some, you know, 
places where people don't agree, but there's a much more, it feels to me, uh, debate, disagreement, but in a way that uh, is much more collective um, and, and less um, sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, characterized by sort of massive fissures that you might see in a, in a UK board, for an example. Um, so that, that's how I would say. I, think, I would say that the answer is really driven because you can imagine some people are much less consensus. People, some people are much more collaborative, um, but we all end up on different types of boards. So it's much more led by the culture of the boardroom, either by the lead uh, director or by how the I would say culturally the jurisdiction thinks about uh, the role of, of the independents in the, in that uh, room. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll leave you with this thought. You know, one of my favorite boards. I won't name the company. Um, but, you know, the, the, the team used to get together, we'd go partying, you know, have fun, we all knew each other's kids, it was great, everybody was having a wonderful time. And then one of these biggest decisions came into play, you know, like a, hiring a CEO, M&A transaction, and um, to this day, many of those board members don't talk to each other. It can really, it can be really violently, um, be violently a, a negative experience if it's not handled well. Yeah, and of course, this comes to some of the tougher board interactions, uh, which we'll talk yes. about shortly. So um, I'm going, uh, flipping in another direction here, coming back to this, like, what does it take for people personally to be great board members? Um, lots of questions, one on the thread and one previously, can not execs uh, VP or below pursue board ops? Like, when are you really ready? And do you, would you recommend it? You know, when you think about not being at the VP or SVP level, let's say you're a director, somebody here is asking, what if I'm a senior analyst? Like, at what point are you really, um, can you really get a break if you're not at that level of seniority? Should you be in the boardroom? And if so, how would you advise? So, people? you know, my view, first of all, it took me um, a good five to seven years of being rejected on boards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've assumed, hey, I want to continue learning. I've been a, a good, uh, a, a, you know, a decent uh, uh, employee. And I started reading magazines and seeing women being on boards and, and men and really hearing about what they were doing and these complex puzzles they were doing. So I was like, oh, I'd like to do that. How do I put my hand up and say I'm interested? Um, you know, I, as I said, I got on the board at 39. These are, I've always been on large um, global complex organizations. I mentioned to you, we sold SAB Miller for a hundred billion dollars. So, um, in that respect, you know, I don't think there's any bad time. If you're a continuous learner, this is an opportunity for you to learn. Now, yeah. you might not, for a whole host of reasons, land in, uh, uh, in, in the board of a large, uh, you know, $500 billion market cap company off the bat. But, you know, there are many paths to the boardroom that I think people ought to start exploring from day one, whether it's NGOs, um, you know, school trustees, museum, uh, you know, boards, there are lots of those things that have really important influence on, uh, on your understanding of this uh, fiduciary responsibility, even notwithstanding the fact that, you know, one is, you know, one, one might be a for-profit and the other one is not. I mean, if anything, I actually believe it's harder to be on the board of a, a charity of a not-for-profit. And given the fact that ESG now is $45 trillion of assets under management, according to JP Morgan, it's a huge issue thinking about those broader vested interests. We're no longer just about the primacy of the financial shareholder. You know, I would love to interview candidates who say, hey, listen, I have been on the board of Red Cross or my local y, you know, YWCA, and I know what it's like to try and case to different stakeholders. And by the way, I was on the audit committee or I was on the, on the I had to, I was involved in hiring the CEO. It's similar um, aspects of a board mandate. And so my advice is go for it. You know, why not? You know, the worst that can happen is somebody will tell you no. And, you know, we all have to prepare for that. I've been told no many times. Uh, and and sometimes uh, if you're lucky, someone will explain why you're being passed over. And if you're not, you just have to keep trying to do your best and hopefully you'll get a shot. Yeah, I, uh, to add to your, your point, I think that nonprofits are generally more forgiving of, let's say, level of seniority. I've been, I mean, my first board was a nonprofit board and I think I joined it when I was in my early 30s. I didn't join my first public board like you until... I was 39, though 39 is actually remarkably, I think what I've learned is it's young age to join. For me, I was so impatient. I was like, I need to be on one, but it took many, many years as well. Um, but what I would just say is 
that nonprofit experience in my 30s was very helpful. I learned how board worked. They were willing to have me and I wasn't a CEO. I wasn't, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure I was an SVP. I think I was a director at Google at the time. And I got my first nonprofit board. And I, and I think it was very helpful to even learn how it operates. Um, so, but I yeah. think the one caveat I always say to people as well is, if you want to join a board, you do need to be a thought leader at something that is valued by the board and the CEO. Like, where does the company need to help where you can be a true thought leader to the, to the CEO? So in that nonprofit example, you may be a thought leader to a CEO of an, an ED of a nonprofit because they're trying to break into, you know, corporate donations and you know how a corporate works. It, I mean, it can be that simple, right? Or, you know, they may be thinking about business model when, you know, you're a or director. pandemics. You and, might oh, yeah. join Red Cross being a, having knowledge on pandemics and right. logistics exactly. on pandemics. Right. Yeah. Logistics. So I think there are many areas where you can be a thought leader that is not driven by title. But I think conversely, when you're thinking about joining a for-profit, non-profit board, you have to think, what do I have thought leadership on that the CEO and the board values? And I always have looked as that as a litmus test, like, is there something I know? And so then it's not, you know, so I think I luckily got that non-profit opportunity because they considered me digitally savvy, despite that, that I didn't have the title, right? But for that organization, I was the digital expert, right? As a local non-profit. So I do think- And I think- and we've talked about this, I believe, before, but, you know, the other, the, the question I like to answer, and I thought it was interesting, your opening question about how, hey, people want to know how they can get on board. You know, the, the, the other question, the other way of thinking about it is who's going to call you from the management team? I mean, we're all, we all have our hobby horses of what board we would like to be on, but, you know, you should think about, hey, wait a second, who's going to call me from that boardroom? Um, and how can I be of value to that organization in, in its own navigate, navigation of, of challenging issues? I think that's really important. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I completely agree. Okay, so um, we're going to take a few more questions here. Um, uh, we are seeing a question, I'm seeing a question about getting on your first board, you know, is sometimes CEOs are looking for an operational board member in getting on your first board. So they sort of, so they want you to be there to be of service to, the, to them. So you can imagine you're um, recruited by CEO who wants you to be their thought partner. How do you balance this with bringing broader issues up at the boardroom to solve, you know, issues at roost causes, not just symptoms. So I think what this person is talking about is you have a CEO who wants you to be their thought partner, but you also have a fiduciary responsibility in the boardroom to maybe bring up a topic and a bigger topic and, and, and drive to a root cause. So I'm going to extrapolate from that question this person is talking about, how do you manage being a thought partner to the CEO and serving them versus, you know, issues you should take to the entire boardroom? How do you navigate that? You know, I've not been in that situation, but I, I can see um, how a number of my board colleagues might have been. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the sort of rule of thumb is mm -hmm. that 40 to 50 percent of the board should really come from people from the C-suite. Um, you know, that's big move from when I joined my first board about 12 years ago, because when I first joined, everybody came from the C-suite, either yeah. the CEO and the, or the CFO. But it is clearly a widening of the aperture. People understand that there's value to be had by having people from different backgrounds. Um, so why do I think that's important? I think it's important because it, it says to me that there are some board members who um, the CEO is going to call and be the, will say, hey, you know what? I need to talk to somebody who has been in the trenches during a pandemic or during trouble um, and think hear from them how I should think about managing the company through this challenging period. You know, it seems to me, it's a very, very, um, you have to be super careful. Uh, and I wrote in the book, um, in, in my book, that you want to make sure that uh, the CEO is not your friend. Ultimately, they're not your friend. And so you can have golf days you can go to one on one dinners and have drinks and be their thought partner. But, you know, there are times you might have to make a hard decision, fire, censure, fine, you know, reprimand for um, you know, egregious behavior, and you have to be able to do that. And um, so in other words, what I would say is prioritization of what your responsibility is on that board is really critical. And you really need to have a, uh, a sort of, uh, what I would say, you know, come to Jesus uh, understanding of that responsibility because there's no doubt about it, hard decisions are gonna have to be made. Um, and I've had to hire and fire many CEOs who were great people, um, but things just didn't work out. And sometimes um, it's very, I think it's incredibly difficult if that person views you first as a friend 
um, and secondarily as a, uh, as a, you know, as a board member or, or colleague, um, they should always be that distance. It feels to me that uh, you are on the board and um, you should be adding value to them and that you are able to maintain distance um, so that you know, sometimes the tough decisions can be made. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think a, a tricky balance to navigate as you try and seek trust with both, but pretty important. Okay, so I'm going to, there's um, a few questions here on board recruitment and board compensation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go there next and believe it or not, we're going to end up uh, having used all our time again and go, and I've got some other questions for you back. <laughs> to the board. But first, let's go to board uh, compensation and recruitment. So um, Sarah's asking, how do you think about compensation as a director? Uh, Yad is asking, how do you approach board compensation for yourself or when bringing someone on the board? So uh, maybe you can take that. And if you have any holes on the private side, I'm happy to kind of cover off on what I see. Sure. So just to understand, um, are the two questions uh, separate because one of them is about how do we set compensation for the CEO or are they both questions about how we think about compensation director. for the board members? Only board it's, board members. How do you think about compensation you as a director? How should you gauge it and think about it? And then how do you think about setting it for uh, if you're running a boardroom? So as I said, I have yes. some perspective on private, but would love to hear you talk about public. Yeah. So, you know, there's not many degrees of freedom on this, um, to be honest. And in fact, for those of you who are interested, I literally just last week, I think it was Thursday, published an article in um, uh, Pensions and Investments, um, which, uh, so can I can send it to you if people want to distribute right. it. Exactly. But it was basically um, something, I mean, the title was something prosaic, like 10 things we think about when we're setting compensation. A lot of them were compensation targeting CEOs, but actually it also applies a lot to the board, um, the board. So for example, we don't um, like to see, or we definitely uh, manage against board compensation rising when uh, the company's not doing well. Uh, you know, if we're not paying dividends, what the heck are we doing increasing our salaries? But, you know, uh, you know things like uh, thinking about ratios it's become a very popular topic. You know, what's the ratio of the board, average board to, uh, to the, the, the average in the, in the company or the lowest paid in the company, et cetera. Those are conversations that we think more and more about. But just in terms of setting the compensation, um, you know, we get, uh, as I said, for public, large global public companies, fewer degrees of freedom. We get a lot of um, input from uh, compensation consultants on what the uh, sort of uh, um, uh, sort of comparables are from uh, comparators, you know, other large companies, other companies in our sector. Um, we think a lot about how we, you know, how to think about the uh, the, the breakup between dividend and you know, paying uh, stocks in, in some kind of RSUs versus cash. And believe it or not, and I talk about this again in my book that you know, it, even that is wrought with, uh, fraught with issues because in some jurisdictions, they want board members to hold the stock because then they're sort of aligned and, and sort of uh, the, the, with, the, with the investors and with the, the other stakeholders like employees. On the other hand, in other jurisdictions, they don't want you to hold the stock because they then think you're sort of got uh, a sort of a conflicts of interest and you might want to try to sell the company so you can gain a windfall. So it's, there's no settled uh, view on that, but that's another area that we think about. Um, you know, I would say the the one thing that perhaps people don't really uh, uh, fully appreciate all the time is that depending on what committee you end up on, your compensation differs um, tremendously. Um, so if you are the chairman of a committee, your compensation is altered very, uh, you know, usually if you end up on the audit committee, your compensation is, is much higher that way. Um, the last thing I'll just say, because I was talking to somebody who's about to join a private company, and, and so Kinder, you'll have more to say on this. Um, but they were asking about vesting and RSUs and all this kind of stuff. And by and large, for a publicly traded company, you're not allowed to sell stock until you've left the board. Um, and that's kind of, again, I'm sure there's some exceptions, but by and large, that's kind of uh, the way, the rule of thumb in terms of how we think about running it. I don't know whether I've covered uh, uh, you know, the, some well, main points. I think you yes. have in the sense that public boards, I mean, you have to work with a compensation consultant. There's benchmarking yeah. against your peer group. Compensation yeah. is close. There are no brands of freedom to negotiate your own rate as a board member. That does not exist in a public board. Right. In a private board, it is much more unregulated. Um, I, I think the way that everybody should think about it on this phone call is depending on stage of company, quite frankly, early stage boards up until right before they're public, they don't even pay cash. It's all equity. So what you're really working for is equity upside. 
often board members, you know, can benchmark how much equity they should get from how early stage a company is. So that's a way to think about it. You know, if you're an advisor or board member, you're getting more equity in an early stage company. And then as it gets towards going public, you know, obviously the amount of equity you get comes down substantially. And I think the third thing is in private companies, you typically can get some triggers for change of control or, right. um, uh, or those types of things. Um, and, and I think one thing most private companies don't do well and you guys should all think about is setting board term linked to compensation. People will negotiate compensation without negotiating term. And I'm like, okay, this makes no sense. So if somebody's giving you a percentage of equity for the company, are you signing up for three years? Are you signing up for two years? Are you signing up for five years? That's very different annualized pay, <laughs> depending yeah. on, right? So I encourage you would always think about your compensation at a private company in terms of equity and in terms of linking it to a specific term. And even if the CEO doesn't bring that up, you should bring it up and say, look, I, uh, is this for over a three-year time period? What, what time period is this over as opposed to being kind of not clear about that? Um, and, and acceleration provisions and so on. So that's how you think about it privately. Okay, we've got a ton more questions, of course. So um, let's keep going here on the ones that are, I would say, recruitment oriented, and then we're going to come back to sort of general boardroom themes. Um, so someone is asking, how do you really position yourself? If you're, if you're in a company that doesn't let you serve on a board while you're in an operating role, and we do know of companies where that is the policy, um, when you come out, when you go to retirement, you have a different issue, which is that people may think of you as less relevant. So how do you think about positioning yourself um, for board service in, you know, if you've retired from an operating role um, and you're, you know, because, because your company wouldn't let you serve? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think, first of all, the good news is that really the mood music is changing very quickly and very dramatically with regards to this point. Uh, we are now uh, really uh, insisting that uh, um, people in the C-suite and even, uh, you know, C minus one um, do uh, look at the opportunities uh, to be bored while they're serving. I think it's really important because really what's driven that is that uh, how many times have we heard board say, well, I really like this person, but they don't have any board experience. Well, now we're saying these companies should allow their employees to to get that board experience. And, and we are, I mean, honestly, I can't tell you how many times uh, it's gone from zero to a hundred in, in just a few seconds. And I'm, I, I think that's really good news. So I would just double check and, and see if that uh, hasn't changed in your own company. I think it is, it, look, I'm not gonna um, sugarcoat it. The competition is tough. Um, you know, I, uh, I can't tell you how many times people uh, even family members uh, have said, oh, well, you know, given the mood music now, you're a black woman, you're educated and you, and by the way, you've been on boards, you should have the pick of the litter. It's just not how it works. A lot of things have to go right. You know, the board has to, you know, be, be looking for somebody. Um, they might have very specific things. I mean, you were talking about operational experience. I would fall at the first hurdle on that because I didn't grow up in, a, in that environment. Um, and so I think that you constantly have to hone your narrative. I think the other thing that I touched on earlier, which is really important, is just showing that you're a continuous learner. You know, I'm struck by how many times people leave uh, a particular role and they, they just you know, I, I and I listen, I understand this. There's a lot of infrastructure that is already hard for them to understand. Who am I going to call if I have an IT problem? What about my phone? Who's paying my phone bill? You know, there's things that we take for granted working at a company. You know, you, you're already working on those things. But if I'm a board member, I'm really looking for somebody who is going to remain engaged and interested in the world. Now, how do you show that? Um, because you're not going to, I don't know what newspapers you're reading or how you spend your private time and whether that's actually enhancing value. But I can look and say, hey, is this person involved with their local uh, Rotary Club? Are they involved with the Council on Foreign Relations? What are they doing um, in terms of being part of uh, an audit um, you know, group? Or, you know, there's a whole list of these types of uh, um, sort of uh, institution and, and groups that I think are, are great watering holes that show that you're still engaged, you're still interested. And it really is, and I think, Sekinda, you've said this before, it's about shaping your own narrative. I mean, nobody, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it for you. Um, mm -hmm. I gave myself as an example, my, my resume in many ways is, is pretty patchy. You know, I did spend uh, nearly a decade at Goldman Sachs and I spent some time at the World Bank, but beyond that, I haven't really spent a lot of time being a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. 
So it's very easy for me to be dismissed outright. Yeah, she's got intimate experience. What, is, what does she do? So that's the onus is therefore on me to say, hey, listen, I am a risk person. I understand risks globally. I understand capital allocation risks and, and, and really shaping that narrative. And that's what you need to do, particularly if you are not um, affiliated to an institution. And I'm an example of that. Um, I'm not affiliated to a particular institution. Um, it just means that you've got to be even more diligent about crafting your message and why you think you're relevant, especially to a particular company and especially at a particular time. Fair enough. And thank you for answering that question. So there's a bunch of questions here around board recruitment. So let, I'm going to, I'm going to send some to you. I'm going to take some because there's a lot of mystery here around, you know, what's happening in the world of recruitment. Um, so um, the, the first thing I'd like to say is somebody's asking, what's the base, best, best place to get help for recruitment and placement? Are, are recruiters, is it typically recruiters, is it typically the board list? And there's another question that says, so gosh, given that we're in a world of URM, is even more going through the board list than personal networks? There's another question about paying an advisory firm. So let me bundle these all together. There's a lot of mystery here. So first and foremost, I think all of you should think about the world of boards as operating um, in two ways. Whether a company is public or private, my experience is the CEO is always tapping their own networks as our board members, whether a recruitment firm is engaged or not. Um, I know that because of the board list, we see it all the time. We see companies that are too small to recruit a recruiting, to use a recruiting firm. And we see companies that are big enough to recruit, use a recruiting firm. But the first port of call is the board and the CEOs are always using their own networks. Let me say that, whether there's a recruiter in place or not they are always working their personal networks. And for those of you who don't um, maybe understand the board list origin story, the board list origin story and platform, it is a platform for recommending others, knowing that the world works through the second and third and fourth order networks. And what we say to people is if you have a homogeneous network, well, you know, we still want to have you have you have a trusted place to discover recommended talent. And so this network of recommendations is the way the world works. <laughs> like, let me say that. Now, in addition, many people will recognize that their own networks may not have the person they seek. And this is even more true if you are you know, in a diverse group and let's say a CEO's network is very homogeneous. So realizing that they will go to platforms like the board list or where they're still looking for a high level of curation and recommendation, they may also hire uh, a search firm. Those search firms are quite expensive, but as a company gets bigger, inevitably, most public companies do in fact retain a search firm and some unicorns might do the same. Very few companies you know, that are early and mid-stage are going to pay you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a board member recruitment. But I just want to make the, the point to everybody on the call, you always have to work your network, always. Whether you're working that network to let them know that you're interested in boards and they are the people who know you best and are most likely to recommend you, whether you're asking them for a recommendation to a platform like the board list. Because again, we work on the system of recommendations ourselves, right? in order to build a curated network. And many of the people who recommend on the board list also end up recruiting for their own board. So we have sort of a virtuous cycle. Or whether in fact, you're also talking to all the recruiters who may be calling you. So if a recruiter calls you for an executive position, my number one piece of advice to you is to let them know, even if you're not changing your day job, that you are looking for a board. This is how you will get connected with the board recruiter. So sorry to go like wax so lyrical on this topic, but because the board list and I spend all our time watching how the world works on recruitment, it's not an or, it's an and. And I would encourage you that the thing you can do if a recruiter calls you about job A, if you don't want job A, you can say to them, by the way, I am looking for my first board. I don't know who in your practice, you know, manages the board practice, but I would love to have a conversation. This is why you take a recruiter call, by the way. <laughs> if you don't want to change your day job, you should still take that recruiter call so you can let them know that you're interested in a board opportunity. So you just have to go everywhere because the world of boards, unfortunately, is remarkably fragmented. And even though on a platform like the board list, we might be trying to consolidate it. So every board search starts, of course, selfishly, we'd love every board search to start on the board list, but we live in a world where you have to honestly work all aspects of your own network, including professional recruiters. So that's my feeling as well as your, the people you know. Dan Bisa, anything to add on this point? So sorry, I took this question over, but- Not at all. No, I think very simply, let me use myself as a live example. I have never, um, in all the boards I've been on, I've been over board, uh, on the boards of over five companies. I have served in different jurisdictions, uh, the UK, 
US, Canada, continental Europe, different sectors, um, consumer goods, energy, banking, uh, mining. Uh, and uh, I have never once um, been recruited by a, uh, a headhunter or a recruitment firm. All of my board opportunities have come through my networks um, in that respect. And it's not that I don't know the headhunters or the search firms, I do. They, but you know, in many respects for me, as a, somebody who's been a, uh, uh, an unconventional board member, I think it's been uh, more of a, uh, they've been more of a necessary evil. They've done the vetting. They'll say, okay, Dambisa, we really like you. We want you to, we want to take this conversation further. We'll send your resume here to company X and they'll do a vetting of you. So it's important to know everybody. Um, and you know, I think for people in particular who come from uh, the C-suite or from executive operational roles, um, that's, that is the, that's where you can best get the, be the most upside. But um, as Sukinder said, there is just no, uh, alternative to uh, to uh, a network. It, it's just not, not possible. It doesn't exist. I would not be on boards. Um, I got the door slammed in my face for years, multiple years, um, by going towards, uh, to, by going to search firms. And I think now there's probably a bit more an, of an understanding that the aperture is widened and they should be more open-minded about how they think about this. But the truth of the matter is you've got to, you've got to focus on your, your, uh, on your network. Yes. And of course, again, to be clear, you know, platforms like the board list are trying to solve that network problem by saying, That's like, right. look, you know, use the power of your network, but use it in a scalable way. And as we aggregate supply, you know, basically generate more demand, which has certainly happened, but it's really all three, your personal network, using platforms like the board list and working recruiter relationships of my public boards. I've served on, I guess, five public boards and then other boards that have since gone public. Three were network, two were recruiter just so folks are clear between, uh, in, in my case. So, um, okay, so uh, a couple of other topics that we're gonna go to next. Um, one more on the recruitment side, and then we're gonna come back up all the way up and talk about what boards are dealing with in our last five minutes. Um, somebody asked a question about these newer services that say, if you pay me, I will place you on a board. I'm curious, Dan Bisa, if you've seen that work, because there are some newer services that say, God, if you pay me a fee, I will place you. Um, in all the boards I'm on, I know of one board member who actually, whose company did pay a fee to a service who managed to get him placed. But that is, that's the only time I've ever seen that model. And I've seen it. Never I, seen I, it either way. I, we've, I, the boards I'm on have never, we've never used that approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know anybody who's ever gotten a board that way. Um, you know, but let me know who those companies are. I'll send them. I'll, I want to find out how much it costs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> As I said, there's some newer services that are saying we'll represent you to companies in order to find a board. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen boards turning to those practices. I think boards are largely still looking for vetted, um, recommended, experienced candidates um, and experience not at the board level, experience in the areas they have domain expertise. Let me be clear. And they always will. And they always will, you know, I always, uh, I think I've told you this before, you know, it was, um, I was reading the paper once and I was like, oh, you know, Amazon would be a great company to be on the board of. And I opened the paper and they've appointed Indra Nui. And I'm like, of course, they're going to have Indra Nui on the board of Amazon. I mean, she was the CEO, you know, notwithstanding or never mind that she's, you know, Indian born by background and uh, a woman that that becomes false by the wayside. This is somebody who, of course, she should be on that board. It's like, Melody Hobson, she's a chairman of Starbucks. Of course, she should be the chairman of Starbucks. You know, look at her background, look at what she's accomplished. And so, you know, I find it interesting when people say, oh, I can 100% certainly give me money and I'll put you on these boards. I just, uh, I, I don't think that's how the world is now. I think it's a lot of networks and I think a lot of it is about ultimately competence and company and that sort of marriage of companies looking for a certain thing, but at the same time, you're looking for them and, and meeting a meeting of the mind. And that's why it's really important to get it right. Because as I said earlier, if you, it, it's that magic um, or lightning in the bottle, you hope it happens and you hope you stay for at least 10 years, um, certainly on big companies. But if it doesn't, it's horrible. It's horrible to be on a company um, where you, you don't feel you can leave. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Got it. One last question here on recruitment, and then we'll come back out. What about being parts of certain groups like Latin corporate directors associations? And I would say, by the way, generally, I would say, uh, you know, I think in a world where uh, diversity on boards is definitely is really an issue. I think working in, asso in associations, NACD, the Latin Corporate Amer Directors Group, MLT, if you're African-American, all of these networks are being tapped again. So 
So I think those associations are great places. The board list work with, works with many of those affinity groups. Why? Because we, of course, are looking to find credible, recommended, talented, you know, board prospects. And we know that many of these leadership groups, you know, have affinity groups where they touch folks that we may not know, right, or who haven't been rec directly recommended. So if you're, um, you know, a part of an affinity group, I don't think there is any, um, anything but opportunity there, meaning that many recruiters, many platforms like the Boardless will want to partner with those networks to tap into new pools of talent. So I think that uh, I think those networks make a lot of sense, to be honest, um, as places to also start to make your interest known and, and uh, associate with. Okay, we're going to zoom all the way back out. We spent a lot of this conversation, I, which I'd hoped we'd do on um, how do people think about uh, how do people think about um, their own recruitment and journey to the boardroom? But I'm going to zoom out and like let's get kind of uh, real on sort of where boardrooms are today. You have sort of touched on the issue of morality and ethics as a looming issue for the board for the boardroom. I would agree, and a new issue: issues of culture, talent, inclusion at the company level. Forget at the board level. Just what is going on um, with regard to morality and culture inside the company? Um, are there any other areas that you think are particularly relevant for the folks on the phone as they head into sort of their own board ambitions, 2021, 2022? Like what else is, are the most salient topics for boards right now that everybody on this phone should be aware of? Well, I have to believe that, um, you know, many of them will be obvious. I think it's just a, 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 a sort of a, it's important to form an opinion about, uh, you know, where you think the world is going and again not just focus on the the downside risks but thinking about upside i mean i think areas in no particular order um such as uh deglobalization the the sort of economic outlook very challenged economic outlook rise of china digitization um mental health of employees where the what are the responsibilities of uh, of corporations and for, for mental health uh it, it, all these are, are very important issues environment um, you know, where, how do you square the circle between uh, environmental, oh, my lights have just gone out, <laughs> uh, talking about environment, uh, nicely timed, uh, talking about risks, uh, the downside risk, you know, mitigation, but at the same time, thinking about investment and upside, uh, uh, upside opportunities. So I think all of these are, are very key areas. I think um, the geopolitical environment, how to manage people in, a, uh, in an environment that is um, much more fractured among employees, among stakeholders, questions around uh, prioritization. I mean, it's just a, it's, a, it's a, an ever evolving list of challenges. Um, and very often we're being asked to opine and address these issues, even though we are not uh, hired uh, by, or I should say hired, I should say we're not elected officials. So um, I would say be prepared for that. Be prepared for um, dealing with addressing complex issues that uh, there is no right answer. You know, I, in the book, I talk about President Obama's comment that by the time something hit his, his inbox, it meant it was extremely difficult. If it were easy, somebody else would solve it. That's exactly the same with boards. Be prepared to solve complex, hard issues that don't have one answer. Um, and, you know, it can be deeply infuriating. The world's a very complicated place, very challenged place. I was just on a call earlier today where a very well-known doctor, not Fauci, but somebody of that level, just said to me that they thought it was um, odd that we were all walking around like the pandemic risks have uh, declined. He actually thinks the pandemic risk is, is, is not only high, but uh, continues to increase with new strains. And I, I kind of thought, well, I'm just about to plan for a, a July 4th barbecue. And I mm -hmm. thought, he's actually right. And so it's those curveballs that mm -hmm. we have to think about um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, Dambisa, although you're in the dark, I was, it's been a pretty <laughs> enlightening see? conversation. It's, it's, uh, I'm sorry your lights went out, but, uh, but really happy you could join us for another hour. Obviously, for everyone on the phone, you can, I'm sure you can follow Dambisa probably on LinkedIn. I'm sure you have a LinkedIn profile yes. for you, Dambisa, and, and, and certainly has a great book uh, and hear more of her wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And then for those of you with, who all have recruitment questions regarding the board list, we're happy to answer them again. For the board list, it is actually an open platform where anyone can apply uh, to be a prospective board member and bring their own recommendations. So uh, that is certainly one platform among many that you should be using to make your board ambitions known and try and you know uh, operate in this world of kind of 
creating new networks that we're talking about. Thanks, Stampisa. Really appreciate it. Stay in touch. Drop me a Take line care. on LinkedIn. Thank you, Sekinder. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You. Bye. Bye.